welcome everybody this this morning or this afternoon and evening wherever you're dialing in from. I'm very pleased to have uh, my colleague uh, Marina here, who's to, who's teaching a brand new course at, at Yale SOM, which will be part of the master's program, uh, but also doing a uh, um, a sort of pre-run of it this this year uh, in in uh, at Yale SOM on ESG investing. And uh, Marina, thanks thanks for uh, being here and and for doing this. Thanks for having me. <laughs> so um, I'm going to start with with just sort of the a general question, which is, um, you know, uh, you've been working in the field now for a couple of years, but the, the interest in, and, and particularly with your time at AQR, the interest and in demand in, in ESG investing, and just to make sure everyone knows what we're talking about, um, you know, we're talking about environmental, social, and, and governance uh, investing, uh, it continues to increase and, and gain attention. Um, how have you seen demand grow, and why do you think this is becoming an important topic in investments right now and, and possibly for the future. Um, so I think, so thank you for introducing what ESG actually is because, and we'll talk more <laughs> about it hopefully in the next half an hour, but there's definitely still a lot of uh, ambiguity there. And, um, but as you said, so in my time at AQR, um, so starting about two years ago, it was the topics that people were talking about and we definitely were hearing some from clients, but the, amount to which has grown over the past two years is incredible. And I'm not going to sort of, I can probably spend 30, 15 minutes talking about different statistics, but if you Google anything about ESG, any metric, assets under management, inflows into various funds. Um, I mean, if you even look at Google search for the term ESG, it's, you know, exponential over the past couple of years. And I think there are several reasons for the kind of growth in the past couple of years and why I do think it will be a long-term trend, even though you know that we can't forecast the future. Um, so there have definitely been several reasons for the recent increase. So there's been a litany of ESG related scandals just in the last year alone, um, three out of five big CEOs and chair people had to resign in the US due to ESG related scandals. Um, there's also some evidence that it is actually benefiting businesses and investors to be thinking about ESG. So there's been um, academic research that shows that, for example, under social, sort of happier employees means better performance for the companies. Um, also, re um, there's been evidence in academia and practitioner research that ESG is related to short-term and long-term risks. So as I mentioned, scandals is obviously a big risk for companies. Um, climate change is another more long-term um, kind of source of risk. And there are many others like cyber risk and um, et cetera. There's also um, some evidence and we can talk about it more, but it depends whether you talk about ES or the G branch, but there's definitely evidence that ESG can benefit investments and asset managers. Um, there's evidence that especially in the G branch, there's um, alpha to be generated. And the reason I think that it's probably um, not just a fad, but it will be here to stay. Um, I think some of the drivers behind the changes are more long-term. For example, there's definitely been a demographic change that's been happening. Um, sort of the, as the baby boomers who have been holding most of the assets over the past um, you know, many years, as they retire and the new owners of wealth are younger people, millennials, they're much more aware of the environment of ESG. And so I think they will be, as they become the clients, um, they will be continuing to push in this direction. And actually COVID has definitely accelerated the demand for ESG. Um, I think that was sort of an interesting key study because a lot of people were saying that the fad is just driven by the bull market. That doesn't seem to be the case. Um, there's definitely been a lot of, even though the markets were plummeted in the beginning of COVID, um, the demand has been increasing. And also there's been, I think, more evidence that taking care of your employees and customers. So the S branch is important. There's been a lot of regulation that I think will cement kind of the long-term um, existence of this. Uh, and the, uh, the regulation has been for companies, for asset managers, for clients. Um, but that being said, this is still, and this is why I'm very excited to be teaching this course. This is still a wild west. Uh, there are over 500 ESG metrics, um, as we can talk about in a second. They're sort of not very correlated. Um, and there's still so much more research to be done and um, 
sort of hopefully having more people who take classes like this to understand this topic in more detail. So what, yeah, yeah, that there's, there's a lot there. <laughs> there's a lot there that uh, in, in ESG. And I think you, you hit on just even, you know, some of the major highlights, um, you know, given that you're going to be teaching this course this spring, can, can you give the students a, a sense of what you're going to be able to cover? It sounds like, you know, you're, uh, you could cover a year's worth of material uh, on all the things that are going on. What do you, um, you know, if you can describe your class a little bit or what you envision it to be, and I know it's the first time out, so it's going to evolve, but uh, what are some of the things you're hoping to, to accomplish to give the students a sense of what you'll cover? Yeah, so as you mentioned, this is the first time we're teaching it. So yeah, there's definitely it's a work in progress. Um, and we had to pick and choose um, which topics we cover just because, again, we would love to cover sort of everything under ESG, but that definitely will not fit into seven weeks. Um, and so we will start by introducing, I think that's very important, regardless where you come into the ESG perspective from, we'll introduce what ESG means. Um, there's so much jargon floating around if you start reading articles about it that will, you know, try to define all the terms. We'll talk about regula regulations and your regulatory bodies. Um, and then we'll start talking about, you know, climate change, responsible ownership, and um, probably the main kind of focus of the company will, uh, of the class will be more from asset management side. So talking about portfolio selection, portfolio construction with ESG in mind. Um, the area basically we won't unfortunately have too much time to talk about is impact in the sense that we'll talk about how asset managers or clients can be thinking about ESG, um, but, uh, and how, you know, asset managers may interact with companies, but a little bit less whether we're sort of making the world a better place. Uh, partially because that's even harder to measure, but and unfortunately we just won't have time for everything. Um, we'll also more focus, again, we have to <laughs> pick and choose on corporate securities. Um, it's a lot of the things we'll be talking about. There's research now that shows it will also be relevant for corporate bonds, but um, so we won't have too much time to talk about other asset classes. But what we're hoping to do with the class is we're really hoping to establish a framework um, for thinking about ESG and for thinking about constructing a portfolio with sort of ESG, um, ESG topics in mind. And we hope that students sort of understand that there are a lot of pros and cons to different approaches um, that's based on sort of academic and practitioner research and um, that so, you know, students understand that there is a lot of nuances that, as I mentioned, is still a very young field. So hopefully once people take the class, whenever they talk about ESG, whether from a client perspective or from the asset manager perspective, it won't be sort of a knee-jerk reaction to some things they read in the media, but sort of they'll have a very um, strong and um, detailed framework to put new information into. And, and one of the things that, that I know your area of expertise, having worked with you and, and knowing your work, is on textual analysis and linguistics and, and really measurement with, with new data. Um, is that something that um, you yourself have, have brought to ESG research and something you're hoping to cover a little bit in class? Because one of the challenges I hear from people is that measuring ESG, especially, you know, G, not so much, but E and S are particularly tough. Um, is that something that you're hoping to cover as well? And I, I know you don't have a, you have a finite amount of time to do so, um, but I'm, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on, on what you think could be useful to students here as well. For sure. And um, that is something that will uh, definitely, what I'll definitely cover um, in the sense that that's just part of my research. And that's one area that I'm very excited about uh, as ESG. As an academic, I'm always excited about things that are hard to measure and try to think of new ways to do so. And um, as you said, actually measuring ESGs, especially the E and S part, can be quite tricky. Well, first of all, um, defining ESG, as we talked about, it's hard. So often people try to measure things that they don't necessarily agree on what they're even trying to measure. So that will be obviously part of the course. Um, and we can talk about sort of how different people think about incorporating ESG or measuring it. Um, and as you mentioned, in terms of measuring, so some things like G, for example, that's governance. So one of the more famous examples of accruals, that's based on financial information that's easy to measure. It's available for a long time for a lot of companies. Some other issues that creep up is for 
if you try to look at numbers um, that companies produce, so first of all, there's often short histories as a, pertaining to numbers related to ESG, uh, especially to ENS, just because it's a fairly new trend. And so companies have not been producing those numbers for a while. Also, um, often depending what you're interested in, it can be quite industry specific. So it's hard to get a big cross section. And more recently, um, there's actually a paper I saw about measurements that uh, I thought was fascinating. It's about, uh, it's called rewriting history too. And they actually looked at one of the biggest ESG pro data providers. And if you look, you know, download their data now, um, companies based on their measure during COVID have done extremely well. If you download their data two years ago or right before COVID, that result goes away. Um, of course, they claim that they've redone their measurement or the way they measure things. But, you know, so it's, there's a lot of, even if you have data from a very reputable provider that can be an issue. And there was a paper from MIT that looked at different measurements of ESG. And they found that again, across some of the main providers um, like MSCI and Refinitiv, the correlation was often as low as 0.3. And if you compare that to ratings, for example, by Moody's as S&P, their correlation is 0.99. So that hopefully demonstrates how early we're in the process. And as you mentioned, a lot of my own research has been in um, natural language processing. And the reason I've gotten so excited about ESG in the first place, well, first of all, I do think it's a very important topic um, for asset managers, but more for society. Um, but also that's one of the area in finance where there's actually fairly limited, as I mentioned, numerical data available. Um, partially due to lack of re uh, regulation on what companies have to report and then the way companies measure. But companies have been producing a lot of, um, a lot of uh, like <laughs> written uh, text. So there are new uh, corporate uh, sustainability reports that most companies produce nowadays. And so in natural language processing, and that's something we'll definitely talk about in the course, is a sort of very natural way to think about measuring some of these things. Um, for example, uh, one, one way people thought about or think about measuring ESG is there's these uh, social development goals that the UN has put forward about five years ago. And so one of my projects is, and I'll talk about that in the class for more details, is to try to use language to understand how companies' actions and companies' reports align with those goals, which is a, quite a bit, like we're hearing from a lot of clients kind of demand for those measurements. <clears throat> and uh, an interesting other project I have, uh, so again, one issue with, even with natural language processing that shows up in um, ESG is greenwashing. So a lot of times companies might talk about um, things that they're doing or going to use a lot of jargon without actually doing much. So a lot of talk, not much uh, action. And so we're trying to use now, um, actually Lukash, who is my co-teacher in this class, and I are um, writing a white paper about trying to use natural language processing to kind of get at this greenwashing. So there's definitely a lot of space in this area, I think more so than even than more traditional finance to apply some of the machine learning and more specifically NLP methods to really create new measures and make a lot of progress. No, that's, re that's really interesting. And, and just following up on that, um, a lot of the focus lately has been on the E part, right? Measuring carbon mm -hmm. footprints and climate exposure. Um, is your sense that that, that, that measurement of, of E is evolving and still requires a lot of work, but it's it's really the S that, that people are even more confused about or what, what to do with that. Is that something, I guess another way of saying this is, do you, are you gonna make a distinction between kind of climate driven investment change or, um, and versus you know, sort of social and broader society or is it mostly focused on climate these days? Uh, so E can definitely is, or is definitely much broader than just climate. I mean, climate is definitely something we hear a lot from clients about and it's obviously something that's uh, very kind of predominant in the media, but um, there's outside of climate, there's definitely things like toxic waste management, energy efficiency, um, kind of much more, uh, I mean, climate can often be a long-term concern, but a much more short-term is if you're a real estate company, how you deal with elements um, and <laughs> the oldie but goodie, they're still recycling. I mean, there's definitely other, um, other parts of E that are important. Again, there may be a slightly less sexy there um, 
sort of maybe becoming you know, less important now, but um, there's definitely other things there. And we'll talk again, um, I think part of Lukash's sort of lectures, we'll be talking about um, all the individual branches of ASG and going into much more detail and kind of showing what's, um, what's in each of them. Um, yeah. And, and related to this, I mean, you know, uh, you given your background and, and, and your, um, you know, your uh, experience at AQR, which is a systematic quantitative investor, um, do you view ESG as, as mostly operating in the quant space or, or are there, are you going to talk a little bit about opportunities for kind of traditional, you know, discretionary type managers to incorporate this as well? It's, it's much more, it's much broader than just the, the quantitative side, though I know that's your background and Lukash's background for sure. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, how do how does a uh, another way of saying this is how does a you know uh, a concentrated discretionary management think about these issues uh, in the same way or or a little differently? Um, that's a very good question. Um, so I think people think about it and the similarities come from hoping trying to hopefully trying to measure similar things. Uh, so there's definitely similarities from that space. But then I think they're definitely, and we'll, talk, we'll touch on this, as you mentioned, we're definitely focusing more on quantitative methods and portfolio selections from a quant uh, side, but we'll definitely touch on some points where kind of pros and cons of being a quant versus being a discretionary manager when it comes to ESG. And, um, I think so ESG has, or at least the framework we're gonna set up, it kind of has two parts in our mind. There is responsible asset selection and there's responsible ownership. And um, I think there kind of people have um, pluses and minuses depending on um, kind of where you're coming from. And so for example, um, kind of one plus of, um, of quants is, that if you have a very kind of quantitative approach, for example, using some of the NLP methods that I described earlier, you can sort of optimize the portfolio in a way to minimize the impact, sort of it's a little bit easier to do if you're from kind of coming from the quant perspective. Also, it's potentially easier to do uh, more, sort of to be more transparent because we have to be, we can't just read an article and sort of have some sense of what, where they're going with ESG. It has to be like, we have to very specifically say what we're measuring. And from that sense, it makes it a little bit easier when you talk to clients about that. But there's definitely downsides and we'll talk about that in the class as well. And I think you're aware of some of them, but for example, one, um, if you think about engagement, often the way quants are set up is that we have machines do things. We don't have as many people with a lot of hours to spare to kind of go through reports. And if you think about, for example, engaging in, with companies for if you want to push them on, let's say transparency, um, we can measure transparency, but as you know, actually as academics and quants, we often measure things sort of on average. <laughs> So what you can say on average with group of firms is less transparent maybe than this other group of firms. But then if you want to actually go and engage with a specific company, you can't just say on average, you guys were less transparent. You have to actually pinpoint these are the issues that we see. And then, so when we try to do that as a, in the quant space, we suddenly need someone to dig into their um, SSC filings, to dig into their CSR reports. And that takes hours and hours that if you're covering thousands of companies, you just don't have time to do. Um, so I think when it comes to ESG, there are definitely pluses and minuses to be in the quant space. And that's something we'll talk about in class um, and hopefully will be sort of clear to people. Well, you, you, you just uh, raised an interesting point, which is something I wanted to ask later, but, and I think you've already touched on this, but to what extent are you going to, it sounds like it's mostly going to be on the portfolio management side, but a natural question that always comes up is what's the role of activism and, and getting involved in, in change? Like you said, you know, the, the, the goal, of course, is to have impact uh, on society. This course is going to be approaching it from just the investment side mm -hmm. of things for sure. But there's also an activist investor side that is designed to have change. And are you going to are you going to touch on that at all, or is that something that um, you know certainly not any of our expertise, but it but it's certainly a topic that comes up. 
For sure. Um, we'll talk. I mean, this is something that especially Lukash and I, even from EQR side, have more now more experience in than maybe a couple of years ago. Because even asset managers that are quants are being pushed more and more um, to sort of engage with companies as owners. And that is, that's one of sort of the privileges of ownership is to be able to engage with companies. And actually, we'll definitely touch on it from, um, from a slightly different angle. And again, as obviously like a lot of things as ESG, in ESG space, as you mentioned, you could spend months talking about, um, we won't have that much time, but one part of activism is actually something that um, definitely has been interesting for me. There's been some disconnect when talking to clients earlier on now, I think people are becoming more and more on board with this. Um, so the way you sort of think about investing in ESG, one way or thinking about portfolio construction, one way to do it is through um, like exclusions. So companies or our clients would give us a list and say, okay, we don't want to invest in guns. We don't want to invest in tobacco or this and that. Um, well, a big problem with that is if you don't own anything, you don't have a say with these companies. Um, so one way to actually have impact on companies is to be at the table with them. And you, again, you don't do that if you're, you cannot do that if you're not an owner. And so we've been trying to, so part of ESG for us at EQR definitely has been education and well, and something we'll be doing here. And one sort of aspect that we saw some resistance from clients is that to, you need to be an owner and one way to be doing that could be even shorting the stock. Um, and sort of, so trying to get some people that want to have an impact from this idea that, um, okay, I just don't wanna have anything to do with the company to you actually want to be at the table um, to say something. And there's been an interesting example. So churches have actually uh, usually been divesting from um, guns. And then um, a couple of years ago, there was a movement actually led by a Seattle nun um, that they said that they actually have to be owners if they want to uh, be part of the conversation of gun safety. So after a lot of school shootings, and so we saw sort of a very nice um, change of mind where now a lot of churches do actually own gun companies and had a lot of impact in terms of pushing for gun safety rather than just saying, okay, we don't wanna have anything to do with that. Um, so we'll definitely talk about that maybe from more kind of this perspective. Um, one downside, well, for a lot of clients, one downside of that is you kind of have to then own firms with worse ESG characteristics. And as I mentioned, there's definitely some um, sort of resistance to that. Well, that, that's super interesting, actually, because it uh, leads to another question I had, which is, you know, there's, there's always, I think, looming in the background, uh, the specter of regulation or that's going to require certain ESG characteristics, or even if it's not regulation, um, you know, uh, clients are, 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 are demanding it and, and, and demanding certain characteristics. And I think this comes back to the measurement problem. How do you measure that, right? I mean, like you, like you just said, um, you may have more impact as an owner of, you know, poor ESG companies than you do not owning them. And so I think a lot of this is, is going to depend on how these things are measured. Is that something that, that you're you know, uh, going to discuss? Or is there any research out there that's starting to look at this, which is what's the right way to measure kind of your impact on society? That's at the end of the day what we care about. Um, but I think as you just pointed out, just not owning bad ESG companies may not be the best way to have that impact. It might actually be to own them and change them. And, and so um, I don't know how, so I'll get to the question, which is, do you think that, um, you know, the way people are going to evaluate who's good at ESG investing and who's giving the right characteristics, is that evolving? Is that something that, that you're going to discuss in, in the class? Uh, well, I, this, it's a very good question, um, as, especially, again, as I mentioned, unfortunately, we won't have too much time to talk about it. But in the end of the day, a lot of people are hoping actually to have impact on the world and make this world a better place. And so one question is definitely, are we doing that? So we'll talk about that um, to some extent, but partially there's definitely research like in most of the new ESG area, there's new research that talks about it, but it's still very, very early. Um, and for example, there is now some research sort of green bonds being a big example. So that's where people sort of sponsor very specific projects. Um, but there is now new research that shows that there's some not issues as in, I don't think anybody sort of doubts that ESG is doing some good. The question is how much good. 
Um, and for example, they've shown that firms that um, kind of get or issue most green bonds actually tend to be cleaner in the first place. So if you're a big polluter, you just don't wanna kind of deal with any of that. Um, and also sort of partially due to that green bonds issuance didn't actually lead to decarbonization, which was one of the goals. Um, and obviously another big question is, would they, these projects have just been funded otherwise without this green bond? So it's, there's actually, um, and I mean, that's partially why we, for the class, focus more on topics that maybe have a little bit more advanced research where we can actually kind of talk about more concrete measures. But this is an important question where unfortunately there's still, it's a you know, open prairie with a lot of questions that don't have answers. Well, it sounds like there's also a lot of opportunity here for, for new research. Like sure. you said, it's a young, I can see why you're excited about it. It's a young yes. field and, uh, you know, we're just beginning to, to understand how to measure it. And just one last question before we open it up to, to, um, to everybody, which is, you know, are there broader lessons that you're hoping students learn from the ESG? Obviously, it's going to be an ESG-focused course, but a lot of the things you're talking about uh, presumably can apply to other topics down the road that we don't know will happen to the investment world. So are there other broader themes you're hoping that the students take away from, from this course rather than just obviously the specifics of ESG? For sure. I mean, some of it will definitely be um, about ESG and kind of regulations and data sets that are might, maybe more ESG specific. But then um, there definitely will be other parts of the class where we will use ESG a little bit more as laboratory to understand some of the kind of broader financial methods. Um, so we'll definitely try to kind of reintroduce and explain more how companies or asset managers think about value and risk trade-offs. Um, how to think about portfolio construction, as we talked about how to use um, machine learning tools, especially natural language processing. And as you're aware, kind of has been used in many other areas in finance. Um, and also I think, well, and, and the two things also ESG in terms of ESG, while we'll focus on portfolio construction, I think just as an educated citizen, it's a big topic now. And so hopefully students will just have a broader understanding of that, um, of the topic more particularly and also how to think, I mean, this is not the first time a new area comes up in finance where it's unclear if it's a fad or not. And sort of there's a lot of kind of ambiguity. And so hopefully students will also get a sense for how to take an area like that, which will I'm sure come up again in the future and sort of put a very structured framework on that. Excellent. Thanks. Um, Thanks, Marina. Um, I'll turn it over to you, Emily, and see what sure. questions we have. <laughs> yeah, we've, we've gotten some really good ones. Uh, so we'll start here. This is a bit of a two-part question. So um, one of our attendees is asking, could you talk a little bit about integrating ESG factors in the factor pricing model? And relatedly, do you believe that it would be feasible to isolate one of the ESG factors and build an investment strategy based on that? Um, that's a very good question. So um, we're, I mean, we're definitely going to talk in class in a lot more details with slides and formulas uh, about how to um, think about integrating ESG as sort of a factor, because as I mentioned, there are several ways clients are thinking about or asking for uh, how to uh, view their investments with respect to ESG. So one, as I mentioned already, is to just completely exclude certain industries or certain companies, but also obviously that can be quite, um, can't, doesn't have to be, but can be hurtful to performance. Um, whereas another way to think about it is to sort of do what's called tilting. So you um, basically build an ESG factor and um, you maybe weigh companies within your portfolio based on the exposure to that. And, um, or you just set a total, let's say carbon target for your, um, for your portfolio. Downside of that being that depending on performance, you can be loading on some very heavy polluters, which is not palatable to all clients. Um, in terms of whether, ESG, whether it's feasible to kind of build ESG as a factor the way we talk about sort of factors. Um, that has been sort of less, the research is a little bit less conclusive, partially because what's truly defined, at least in academia, as a factor, it's often often has a lot of academic backing and academic theory behind it. It's usually 
uh, has to, well, have to or they tend to work across different asset classes, geographies, et cetera. And I think we're just way too early in the ESG space to sort of be very comfortable and confident to say, yes, we have an ESG factor, but we'll see what happens in the future. Great, thank you for that, Marina. And so we have a question from Ali, which is how are investors managing the breadth of maturity amongst companies in the ESG disclosure space? As an ESG consultant, my clients are often in the early stages of establishing their ESG strategy, often driven by investors and shareholders, and they're concerned about not having the metrics in place to establish goals. How can companies demonstrate that they are in the process of getting their house in order in a genuine and transparent way? Uh, so that's a tricky question uh, or a tricky thing to manage um, in the sense that unfortunately, almost anywhere, I mean, obviously anytime companies can disclose numbers um, that's, and can concrete figures, that's very helpful um, or to, to be showing some progress. Um, in terms of kind of trying to think, I mean, I, I think, you know, from what I understand what she's getting at, like, there's a lot of, as I mentioned, what's called greenwashing going on, which is you take two companies and you just have no idea whether one is actually doing better than the other in terms of ESG, you know, in G, ESG metrics, just because they're both saying wonderful things and a lot of jargon. Um, so I think kind of reducing maybe jargon and um, kind of showing progress towards specific projects can be helpful. Um, but it's, it's, it's a tricky question because as I mentioned, anytime you have sort of within game theory, you have some bad actors and good actors, it can be quite hard to separate yourself from the bad actors. Um, Great, thank you for that. And so another question we received is, do you believe that it would be feasible to isolate one of the ESG factors and build an investment strategy based on that? Oh no, we already talked about that. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Whoopsies. Um, so how about this question? What's the likelihood of establishing ESG metrics as a part of mandatory financial reporting? That's a very important question. Uh, and there are definitely a lot of panels now going on about that. Um, so as some you know, audience members can, might be aware, um, so Europe has been, I mean, that's really something I forgot to say. Um, if you think about ESG globally, uh, sort of Europe and um, Australia and Asia have been way ahead of the United States. Um, and there is now, Europe is actually this year introducing a new sort of taxonomy requiring companies to um, sort of to try to define kind of going back to a question by Ali, can, how can companies show that they're actually doing something? Well, if you don't have any regulatory requirements in terms of disclosures, it can be really hard because it's sort of a free for all. So governments are really trying to, especially in Europe now to create some disclosure measures and maybe move towards closer towards what we have more in traditional finance in terms of disclosure regulation. Um, in the US, we're a little bit behind. I mean, there's the SASB board, um, which is um, the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board that has kind of produced some measures of materiality on which um, kind of which ESG related aspects are actually important for companies and which are not. But I don't know, and this is still a debate um, that's ongoing among, I mean, the SEC chairman recently did say that we're nowhere near in the US of establishing any sort of government um, prescribed standards, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. And it may be that Europe is jumping the gun a little bit. I mean, it took many decades to establish some accounting disclosure standards. And this is such a new area that you might actually, um, decrease research and sort of qualm debates if you too early put on some standards before kind of finalizing the research and really understanding all the issues. So I think it's gonna be quite a while in the US and Europe we're definitely already seeing regulations, but there, and that's what I think I'm really hoping students will get out of our class is there with almost everything in ASG, it's very nuanced and there are a lot of pluses and minuses. And this is definitely one of those topics. Great, thank you for that. Um, another question I see here is, 
can one set a short-term goal when the investment horizon for ESG investing is usually quite long? So uh, that's a very good question because um, obviously some investors have a long, very long-term um, perspective, but um, some investors kind of think a little bit more short-term. And there's definitely, there's space in both. Um, so as I mentioned, climate change can be a long-term perspective, but there even, um, even in that area, there are some shorter-term things one can do. Um, and one of Toby and my colleagues, Brian Kelly, has a paper on that, for example, where they actually use natural language processing to measure um, even now sort of companies' exposure to potentially longer term risk. And so they um, think about how to align your portfolio to control for that. But as I mentioned, well, which is unfortunately a much harder question, but as I mentioned, one reason, um, one of many, many reasons why ESG has been coming more to forefront is um, even if you ignore kind of doing well or doing good, it's doing well, it's all these ESG scandals uh, or ESG related scandals. And obviously that's very detrimental to companies' performances. And there is research now that, and that's a much more short-term goal. Um, and there is now research that kind of tries to, and I'm involved in some of it, tries to understand whether there's any way we can sort of predict and use ASG metric to help um, kind of separate companies that are more likely to have those scandals. And some things are, you know, cybersecurity, all of that falls under ESG and obviously we've seen a lot of related problems to that. So there are definitely some shorter term ways to think about ESG and portfolio you know, selection and some longer term. Great, wonderful. And um, so we have a question from a current student, Tyler. Um, he's asking, how do ESG investors treat companies whose business models rely heavily on scope two emissions, uh, examples being oil and gas providers? and can't improve ESG without radically changing their operations? Uh, so that's a very good question and something that a lot of asset managers are thinking about. Um, a lot of, I mean, so a lot of what we do can obviously depend on demands from clients. Uh, and as I mentioned, that's a, sort of people deal with it in different ways. Um, either you say, okay, we want to exclude those companies. Um, and that has advantages where, okay, you're just, you know, you're not exposed to that and you maybe can feel good about yourself for doing that. Um, the downside is, you know, what we mentioned earlier, you're then not at the table with those companies and you can't push them to move towards greener energy or to invest in greener energies. So that's one downside to that. Um, otherwise people have been dealing with it is to say, okay, we will invest in every industry. And I think that's a sort of fair way to think about it. Obviously some industries will be worse than others. Like tech obviously is gonna have a lot less pollution than some you know, a utility company. But then even within those companies will reward firms that are doing everything they can as the question said, to sort of um, to be as good as, as to do as well in ESG metrics as possible and then maybe push those companies even further into sort of greener energies and help restructure those companies. Great, and actually a follow-up question um, from a previous question, different industry or even countries have different opinions of ESG. Uh, when we involve ESG as a factor to do valuation, do you think we should change the weight of ESG in order to reflect the market emotion? Um, that's a good question. Well, it depends when you say we, who we are. Uh, if you're an asset manager, you have to follow your client's emotions and uh, sort of, you know, do what your clients are asking for. Um, and, I, and I do think it, it is quite reflective in sort of, you know, depending where your client is coming from. Sort of you, we, as an asset manager, you end up taking that into consideration because as I mentioned, um, Europe and Asia and Australia sort of way ahead of um, the United States. And we see that when we talk with clients. Um, we definitely have clients uh, where if they're coming from Europe, like they have mandates where we have to be thinking as an asset manager about ESG or otherwise they can't invest with you. So from that sense, the emotions from Europe then you know, get passed on to what we're doing. Whereas at least up until fairly recently, if you talk to clients in the United States, that was less of a concern. Um, 
I mean, whether, you know, the world should be taking that into account is a broader question probably beyond the scope of this. Well, and I, I'm going to add something to that too, which is, you know, some of the things that Marina and Lukash have done while they were at AQR is also educating clients about the best way to do this. So sometimes it's mandated for sure. Sometimes it's just a client that says, I want to do better for society and I'm not sure what the right thing to do is. Is it, should I exclude fossil fuels? Should I do this? Should I do that? How do I think about this? Um, and, you know, one of the things we do as an asset manager and lots of asset managers do this is have a group that helps clients think through these problems and design sometimes together, sometimes separately, the best way to approach this. And, and I think, you know, it sounds like from Marina's course, you're going to get a sense of that as well, because um, it's also hopefully leading the charge on this in the asset management industry to say, here's a better way to do it for those of you that care about, about doing this. Um, event, you know, if it's strong enough, it can even lead to policy change. But even if it just sort of moves directionally, the way people are thinking about this, um, and I don't know, Marina, if you, if you agree, but I've always found that client, a lot of clients are willing to work with you on this stuff. They just, they, they want to solve the same objective. They're just not quite sure how to do it, right? Sometimes, sure, it's mandated, but sometimes it's just, they, they want to know what to do. For sure. And um, there was actually something I forgot to mention earlier when you asked about clients. That's well, and AQR is sort of broadly, more broadly known for this, but education is sort of a very big part, and especially of ESG, just because there's so much ambiguity there. And as you mentioned, it's exactly right. We definitely have a lot of clients coming to us and saying, we do want to improve the world. Like, how do we go about it? And I think that's, for me, that's even more exciting because then you sort of get to think more broadly about it rather than just being told to A, B, and C. Um, so exactly right. So that's actually a great segue to our final question, um, which would be, how do you strike a balance between ESG with the emphasis on the S here um, and fiduciary duty? Um, so that's been a big debate. Um, and I think that is something we've seen with clients um, where on the one hand, and I, I will not, <laughs> I could talk about this for an hour, but <laughs> I won't. Um, but basically, um, I think part of that is whether you can do well and do good at the same time, because some clients, especially if you're a pension fund and your fiduciary duty is to maximize returns for your investors or for the pensioners, um, you may want to do uh, good, but then you also have to make sure that you're doing well. And that can, so part of educating clients is, I think, to, make, uh, to have them understand that that is not always the same. And again, I'm not going to go into sort of all the details of that, um, but I think that's a very sort of tricky question, uh, sorry, not tricky question, tricky problem. And I think going forward, there's probably going to be more and more regulation and more and more ways of kind of thinking about fiduciary duty and ESG. But for now, again, depending on the client, sometimes you sort of have to limit how much good you're doing because you, they have to do well. Absolutely. So that is unfortunately all the time we have. We had so many wonderful questions and this has been such an engaging session. And I think it's really um, a great opportunity just to highlight the types of conversations that happen every day at Yale SOM uh, between our faculty, our students, our staff, everyone is really learning and engaging in, in some really interesting topics. So uh, Marina, Toby, thank you so, so much for taking the time this morning to spend with us. And Arwen, thank you for your help on the, uh, on the back end, getting through all those great questions. And I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day. Um, thank you very much for having us. And to all the current students, I promise we'll have our syllabus ready soon. <laughs> To all the emails. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Marina. Thanks, Emily. Thanks, Darwin. Take Bye. care. Bye-bye. Everybody, take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.